So, yeah, it's a, it's a great honor to be here. Thank you very much uh, for the invite. Um, so, the talk I'm going to give today is on minimum wages, employment in Europe, and lessons for Spain. As Maria said, it's not my primary um, research area, but it is a research area that I have been active with in for the last uh, six years in the SRI. Uh, we have, uh, we're an independent organization, but we have a contract. We advise the Low Pay Commission in Ireland who make recommendations uh, to the Irish government on minimum wages. And we have produced a series of papers, um, some of which are reports, some of which are published in peer reviewed journals. And that will form the basis of, of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm not going to be going through the real technical and econometrics uh, behind these estimates. It's pretty basic research of minimum wages. You need a couple of things. You need data. You need data on people who are in receipt of the minimum wage, or data on people who are not in receipt of the minimum wage. And ideally, you need time periods, one time period when no one got the minimum wage and another period where the minimum wage is switched on. And in Ireland, uh, you could say we're fortunate um, in some respects that all those conditions are met. So we've been able to do some very interesting sort of um, topics on the minimum wage. But obviously there are a series of reasons for that, that the minimum wage is switched off uh, for a period of almost 10 years where no one received it. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So as the, uh, although we benefit as researchers, uh, obviously there, there are, that is potentially to the detriment of people who would have otherwise been in receipt of the minimum wage. So uh, I'm going to talk slowly because I know my accent, I'm from the north of Ireland, I'm over the border, can be particularly uh, problematic. So in terms of the structure of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about why do we need minimum wages? What are the arguments for minimum wages? Um, what are the risk factors associated with minimum wages? And what is the evidence related to that? Uh, do they harm, uh, do they benefit people? Uh, low wage workers, do they harm them potentially? Do they harm businesses and productivity? Um, and then I'm going to um, reflect on some comparative analysis that we, we, we did again, a, a recent report that we published last year, where we looked at and we compared minimum wages across Europe in terms of what are the rates that the minimum wage is paid? How do they compare across countries? What is the incidence of the minimum wage? Because if you set a minimum wage that is so low that it affects only a small proportion of workers, then it's pretty pointless. What is the relationship between minimum wages and poverty um, and job satisfaction, which is a measure of job quality? And then I'm going to move on to some of the evidence from our individual evaluations where we looked at the impacts of the minimum wage in Ireland. Uh, and the lessons that we, we drew from that in terms of what are the negative impacts potentially on workers? Are there negative impacts for particular groups of workers with particularly low levels of wage bargaining, such as those on temporary contracts, part-time workers? If we're just focusing on minimum wage workers when we're doing this literature, are we actually underestimating the impact of minimum wages? Because if you strike a minimum wage, it not only impacts the people who receive it, but it can have further implications for people further up the wage distribution who earn above the minimum wage. And if that's the case, then the impact on things like income inequality or um, in work poverty may be greater than, than initially we, 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 we think by just looking at minimum wage workers. Um, I talk a little bit about the impacts of, uh, on labour co costs because I believe there's a debate in Spain that if you increase the labour costs or there's concern, if you increase the minimum wage too much, it could harm uh, productivity, it could harm firms and there could be reductions in employment. We have some evidence on that relating to Ireland. And then I'd sum up. And I'm happy to stop for any points in, in, of clarification if that's, if that's required. So why do we need minimum wages? Well, minimum wages have, are becoming an increasingly common component of most developed economies. So most economies and labor markets recognize that there is a need for minimum wages. So based on OECD data, uh, 26 of its 34 members as of 2015 currently implement a statutory minimum wage. So the majority of, of developed economies in the world implement a statutory minimum wage. And why is it implemented? Well, why did governments adopt it? It's primarily there to 
sector that there is a minimum earnings level for low paid workers who are generally accepted to have low levels of wage bargaining power. So as I said, they tend to be in sectors where, that are not unionized, such as accommodation and food in many, in many countries, part-time workers, again, low wage, wage bargaining power, and people on non-temporary, non-permanent contracts, permanent workers who really have little power in terms of negotiating wage levels. So the minimum wage is there to protect those types of workers to ensure that there is a minimum income standard that is met. And by propping up the lowest paid in society, we would hope also that the policy would reduce in work poverty. It would squeeze the income distribution. So therefore levels of general wage inequality should also be lower. So those are the reasons and the policy arguments that economies and labor markets and governments typically use when adopting the minimum wage. However, not everyone is a fan. And particularly uh, within the, even the academic literature, you know, this is a religious issue uh, for some neoclassical economists who really oppose any sort of regulation in labor markets. Um, and, you, and, and you'll see this argument uh, still being played out in some of the journals, but less so because most of the arguments have proven not to really hold much water. But there is a concern um, in terms of when a minimum wage is being struck, usually some sort of social partnership or tripartite uh, negotiations will be involved. And the business side of the, those, those discussions or those, those meetings will, will generally say, look, minim minimum wages cannot go too high because if you do that, um, then there is a possibility that labor costs will increase to such an extent that international competitiveness will, will be affected. And minimum wage workers can also be potentially damaged by increases in the minimum wage. So if employers react to an increase in the minimum wage by firing minimum wage workers in order to reduce the wage bill, that's called an extensive margin effect. So they can be affected at the extensive margin where they lose their jobs entirely as a result of a minimum wage increase or at the intensive margin. And this is where really they keep their jobs, but the employer reduces the number of hours that they are employed for. So they keep their jobs at the higher rate, but their income is reduced because their hours are reduced. So what does the evidence tell us? Very briefly, um, in terms of what the literature says, in terms of employment loss, this impact on minimum wage workers at the extensive margin, we would summarize the international literature as saying, yes, there are some studies, a minority of studies, a small minority of studies that have detected some job loss effects. But the vast majority of the literature finds no effect with no relationship between the minimum, increasing the minimum wage and job loss. That is simply a fact. With respect to impacts at the intensive margin, there is much more balance in terms of the evidence and the literature. So this is the extent we ask the question, when looking at the literature, we're looking at the evidence, do employers react to an increase in the minimum wage by reducing the hours worked of low paid workers? There is more evidence on that. You know, some studies find no effects, other studies find some effects, but particularly effects within particular groups of workers, what we call heterogeneous impacts. So, and, and we will sh I will show you that we did find some of those impacts for, for Irish uh, minimum wage changes. So the evidence, job loss, no, it's not a valid argument. There's no evidence to support that. But there is a, an argument that you need to be careful that workers aren't being affected by reductions in hours worked, by reductions in overtime, and that those reductions aren't focused, particularly within particular groups of very vulnerable low paid workers. So um, I'm now going to look at well, what, what, how does minimum wages compare across Europe? So this is a study that we published um, last year. We use EU silk data and we just said, well, we wanted to know, we wanted to say, we wanted to advise the Irish Low Pay Commission, where do our, our Irish minimum wages sit relative to other countries? Um, how does it relate to things such as poverty? wage inequality, job satisfaction, 
uh, compared to other countries. Do our minimum wage workers look different compared to other countries? Because that also is important for policymakers. So th this is some of the results uh, from that study. And again, I'm going to highlight both Ireland and Spain in that respect. So the first thing we looked at, at was how many people are actually in receipt of the minimum wage? What proportion of the workforce are in the receipt of the minimum wage? So obviously, as I said, if your minimum wage isn't capturing the lower segment of your wage distribution to a certain extent, if it's only hitting one or two percent of people, it's pretty pointless, as is the case in Belgium. So you can see in Belgium, the minimum wage, only 1.7% of workers are affected by the minimum wage. This is based on our own calculations using EU silk data. And we, we, you can look at the report, but we adjust for because we're having to combine hours and and, and earnings, and we allow for a margin of adjustment, but our estimates match exactly with Eurostats. So you can see that, yeah, it's pretty pointless in countries like really Belgium, the Netherlands. Uh, it's, no one's really affected. It's, not, it's really, not really having much of an impact. In Ireland, we're sort of doing a little bit better. Around 10% of employees are impacted by the minimum wage changes, and that, that doesn't change much as, we, as it's in terms of each minimum wage round. I'm just trying to use this pointer because I'm usually terrible at these things. But you can see Spain is at the upper end of the distribution. So um, I think this is using data from um, 2018 that was published in 2020, Silk data. We estimate that around 14% of employees in employment in Spain are impacted by the minimum wage. So it's pretty high and the highest up there is, is Portugal. So in terms of having minimum wages that are effective to a level that they impact people's lives and workers' lives, minimum, Spain is doing relatively well, I would say. Ireland, less so. In terms of how much is the minimum wage, is it really high? I mean, this is a concern for a lot of uh, policymakers. So the blue line is just the nominal minimum wage, and the red, the, or the pink or the orange, I'm a bit color blind. And that's PPP adjusted, so different, so that's fully comparable across countries. So you can see Ireland, we're doing great in terms of the nominal minimum wage. We're second highest in, in this uh, group of countries. So this group of countries, uh, we take Ireland, 12 European countries plus the UK for the South data. We just we couldn't fit everyone into the tables. But you see then, after we adjust for differences in prices, Ireland falls to about sixth. And Spain is pretty high in terms of Purchasing power parity, there isn't much difference between the nominal and the, um, and the PPP adjusted ranking. So the minimum wage in Spain is probably around the sixth or seventh highest within this group of countries after we account for differences in uh, prices. Okay, so, so it looks, to summarize, Ireland is high, not affecting an awful lot of people. Um, Spain is relatively high minimum wage country with a relatively high coverage rate in terms of the number of people that are being affected. Now, when I first started doing minimum, my first minimum wage paper, I wrote when I was in the University of, of Melbourne, where we were advising the Australian Low Pay Commission, and I was as shocked as anyone to discover that most minimum wage workers aren't poor, that the majority of minimum wage workers are actually from high income households. And in Australia, the situation when we looked at it was the majority of them were either second earners in high income households who were working part time or students who, who, were, who were obviously studying. And this is a phenomenon that has been uh, repeated, uh, particularly for the Irish case, but the situation does vary considerably. Generally, we are concerned that minimum wages and poverty aren't well correlated, but there are differences at a cross country level. So here we're looking at the proportion of minimum wage workers who are in households who are at, at risk of poverty. So this is, they belong to a household uh, where the equivalized household income is below 60% of, 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 the, of, of the average. So you can see that in Ireland, we are really not doing well. 11% of our minimum wage workers are in households at risk of poverty. To put it another way, over 90% of our minimum wage workers are not in households at risk of poverty. You can see in the Netherlands, 
and Luxembourg, it's, it's pretty high. So almost half of the minimum wage workers there are actually in households that have a, a, right, a, right, have a relatively high poverty risk. And in Spain, it's a pretty good coverage in terms of one third of Spanish minimum wage workers are in households that, we, that, that are at risk of poverty. The problem with this type of statistic is it's just a cross tab. These minimum wage workers, lots of them are also in accommodation and food. Lots of them are also part-time workers. Lots of them are also in temporary contracts. And all of those factors also increase your risk of poverty. So in the next slide, we run a simple probit model for poverty risk in every country. And we control for all these other variables. And we take the coefficient from the minimum wage and we say, well, what controlling for other factors? What is the extent to which minimum wage workers in each country have a higher probability of being in a, in a poor household compared to non-minimum wage workers. So this is the results uh, from the, the probit model. It's pretty sad, Ireland's coming out worse again here. So in Ireland, um, controlling for other factors, a minimum wage employee is only seven percentage points more likely to be in a, in a poor or at risk of poverty household compared to a non-minimum wage worker. Again, Spain is doing quite well. Uh, the marginal effect in the Spanish model is 17 percentage points. And, the, and, and it's, it's close to the highest sort of element of, there of, of Estonia, the Netherlands and Luxembourg. So again, uh, pretty good. It's not perfect. As I said, it's still the case that the majority of, of people on the minimum wage in Spain will not be in poor households or in households at risk of poverty. But in terms of the Im impacts, it seems to be a lot better. And I will also caveat here a point that I'm going to make later. There's a big risk when policymakers go away and say, well, this is all the story. We're only hitting 70, you know, there's only this marginal effect of 17 percentage points on in work poverty. But if it is the case that by increasing this minimum wage, other people further up the distribution, just a little bit up, but in the next 5%, the 10%, the next 15% are also being pushed upwards in terms of their wages, then the impacts in poverty will go beyond the minimum wage. So if there are wider distributional impacts, impacts that go beyond the minimum wage workers themselves to other parts of the distribution, the impact of poverty on in-work poverty will be greater than what we're seeing here. So it's just to bear that in mind. And I will come back to that in a little minute. So another issue that we look at is, well, there is this perception that minimum wage work jobs are really poor quality jobs. And that minimum wage workers are pretty unhappy. They tend to have worse working conditions. Their, their jobs tend to be more precarious. And um, we would expect job satisfaction levels to be much lower in minimum wage jobs. So what we do here is, again, we use the silk data. And we estimate a job satisfaction model for each labor market. We control for other factors. And we say, well, what in these, in these models, what is the relationship between um, being on the minimum wage and having low job satisfaction. And we use this sort of, the, the model goes from six to t zero to 10 in terms of job satisfaction in silk. Um, so, um, so this is five, six to 10 is job being satisfied. So we, we squeeze that sort of continuous variable into a binary. So what we're saying, actually the interesting bit is in these countries here, there is no, in the Netherlands, Spain, UK, uh, Germany and France, Minimum wage workers are no more likely to be dissatisfied in their jobs than non-minimum wage workers. We find no negative effect. And actually, when we do find an effect, it's, it's, it's relatively um, small for some countries. In other countries, again, Ireland's coming out bad again. You know, job satisfaction levels, um, our dissatisfaction is probably at the upper end of the spectrum of um, minimum wage workers. But I would say for, you know, if we take this sort of cutoff point as being neutral to, to okay. From our sample, you know, 50% of the country's job satisfaction among minimum wage workers was not much lower or the same as those that for non-minimum wage workers. So before going on to our evaluation of results, it's probably worth thinking about how are minimum wages decided in the first place. And the approaches to, the, to minimum wage uh, decision making vary a good bit between countries. And there are different approaches, as we'll see. So 
in Ireland, uh, for example, we have a low pay commission. So this is an expert group that was established in 2015. Um, we have social partners in there, the trade unions are there, um, employ the, the uh, employers are there, economists are there. Um, and they then make a recommendation to the Irish government on the level of the minimum wage. And they are also supported by ourselves in the ESRI, where we have an ongoing program of research where all these papers have been produced that helps inform the low, pay, the low pay commission what rate to strike. This sort of, other countries take a similar approach to Ireland using export committees or, or wage uh, groups like the UK has a low pay commission, so has France, Germany, and Greece. There are several countries that use a formula to determine the minimum wage. So in the Netherlands and Luxembourg, the minimum wage is adjusted based on changes in average wages. Um, Belgium uses a, a pre-agreed formula where minimum wages are based on changes to the cost of living. In Estonia, um, they also have a rule that uh, it's, it's a methodology that's been agreed between the social partners and the government in 2017. And based on productivity and economic growth, the minimum wage will be struck with a stipulation that it must be at least 40% of the average wage. Other countries have a social partnership agreement uh, or approach. In Portugal, for example, the government decides what the minimum wage will be and then they consult the social partners. That was the case in Spain, is my understanding, until 2020. We're now, uh, instead of deciding what the minimum wage would be and then consultation, the approach has moved to a consultation up between the government and the social partners uh, prior to a proposal being formed. And Hungary and Latvia also have tripartite social partnership agreements. This type of approach doesn't always work, it generally does. For example, in Poland uh, in 2019, the, 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 the talks between the government and the social partners broke down. And ironically, the government then introduced a, a minimum wage that was higher than the rate that the trade unions were actually looking for. So the, major, the wage setting characteristics are, our, our approaches are important. We don't know exactly what role they have in terms of the impacts of the minimum wage, but what I would say is if you have a tripartite approach or an expert committee approach, you tend to get a more balanced view on the relative impacts of a minimum wage, and it is less likely, I think, that you will see it having adverse effects on workers or firms. Finally, um, going back to our, our um, well, work on minimum wages on the, at an EU level. It's quite amazing. I've looked at this in Australia. I said we looked at it in Ireland. We looked at it uh, in, across a range of EU countries. There's a very strong set of characteristics that define minimum wage workers, and they don't change very much uh, across countries. So minimum wage workers, tend, they tend to be younger. They tend to have lower levels of education. Uh, they're more likely to work part-time. They are more likely to be non-nationals and they're more likely to be women. There are some differences that occur from country to country. For example, in Ireland, uh, we have the highest concentration in accommodation, food, and wholesale. Uh, again, down to our reliance on tourism, I guess. Um, as, you, as you've seen, our minimum wage workers aren't particularly at a high risk of poverty compared to other countries. And there is no skewness towards females. Males and females are equally likely to be minimum wage workers in Ireland. I looked at the Spanish uh, data, and what I found the standout aspect of the Spanish minimum wage employment model was that non-nationals uh, are more likely to be minimum wage workers in Spain compared to other EU countries that I've been looking at here. So given that I'm going to now move on to talking about minimum wages in Ireland and a lot of the evidence, I'll talk a little bit about the history of the minimum wages in Ireland, not laboriously so. Basically, our low pay commission was set up in 2015. Um, and the first increases became in 2016, 17. So we, the, the minimum wage has increased every year from the low pay commission has been set up. Uh, the low pay commission is chaired by an independent chair who is, a, who, who is appointed by the government. So, well, so how independent is that? That's, but generally speaking, my experience of them, they have been fair. There are representatives from business uh, on one side of the table employers, trade unions, and they're also independent experts. Now, an interesting thing is that although we have had the slow pay commission from 2015, there has been a low pay, a minimum wage act in Ireland since 2000, when the rate was struck at uh, four pounds four, uh, five euros 58. 
I don't know why that's up in Stirling. I don't know. It must have been presented to someone in the north. Um, however, the crisis, the economic crisis stuck. And had us said minimum wage increases stopped to 2007. Interestingly enough, Ireland, well, not, you know, as you know, we had a banking crisis. We had a massive collapse in our economy and we were bailed out. So we had the Troika, which is the ECB, the IMF, um, who's the other? There's the European Commission. Um, so basically they were running the show for two years in Ireland. And one of the first things that they did was insist that the minimum wage was cut. So we had a, um, a temporary reduction of the minimum wage was reduced at the behest of the Troika from 8 to 7 65 to 7 65 in, uh, which is a big reduction in, in 2011. There was a huge amount of uproar in the country at the, uh, because of this, and it was quickly restored. You know, people hit the streets, people weren't happy. But what this just shows you is in terms of these institutions, like the ECB, uh, the IMF, or the Commission, you know, there is a, a philosoph there must be some sort of um, underlying philosophy there that minimum wages are bad and, you know, the way to get, and it's the, it's, it's the people at the bottom are getting paid too much and that's what's stopping economic growth. But it goes back to the point that I make that for some people and for some economists, this is a matter of religion rather than a matter of practical economic policy. And that's the history of, of the minimum wages in Ireland. So we were increasing gradually until 2007. We stopped. The Troika uh, took us down. Then we went back up. And then we stayed sort of there until our minimum wage increases kicked in again after the Low Pay Commission was established. And this is the advantage that I'm talking about, although it is an advantage to us as researchers, because you can see that this break between 2016 and, and 2011 gives us a period of zero minimum wage activity in Ireland, against which we can benchmark and measure um, the impacts of minimum wages in a control and treatment group using a difference in difference scenario. So we can look at the minimum wage workers and the non-minimum wage workers in 2015. You know, what were their hours worked? What was their employment rate before this was switched on? We can then look at it in 2016 and we can measure the difference in the difference. And this is the methodology that runs through um, our, our research papers because we have this sort of inbuilt advantage in the data. Well, for us, again, a stress. So in terms of how you measure these things, it's pretty, pretty basic, actually. It's just a difference in difference uh, methodology. It's just a, a linear uh, regression. Um, so say we have hours worked, we have the year, two, this is a two period one. Uh, we have the year in which the, um, this is 2016, the year in which the minimum wage was introduced. This is our treatment group, the minimum wage workers, and the impact of the minimum wage is just that the interaction effect on beta four, beta four between um, the, the time dummy and the, and the treatment dummy. Very, very basic, but difference and difference equations, as you know, are very powerful. Even though it's a very simplistic uh, framework, the, fixed, the time invariant fixed effect falls out. So it does control for things like time invariant on observed heterogeneity. Now, when you're, and obviously, one of the things you need to check for when you're estimating these models is parallel trends, that are parallel dynamics, that before the minimum wage change, after the minimum wage change, if we see divergence, that's an indicator of a treatment effect, but there should be no divergence in the period before the minimum wage, because if we see the pre-trend was going like that, and the post-trend was going like that, then obviously that's not a treatment effect, that's just a continuation of a, a, a diverging trend. So we have to check that there are parallel trends beforehand. We also need to do things by, when we're looking at minimum wage workers, who do we compare them against? Do we compare them against everybody else in the wage distribution? No, what our approach has been, let's look at the minimum wage workers and compare them to workers who are earning just above the minimum wage. So we can be sure that in doing so, we, they, it's more of a like for like comparison. Some people estimate difference in difference models with propensity score matching, which essentially does the same thing. So our first paper, um, looking at the impact, this 2016 impact of the minimum wage in Ireland, we published in fiscal studies. And actually we had, we had minimum wage changes, but we had no data. Our labor force survey had no wage data. So in this paper, we had to use uh, wage decile information combined with ours to try and guess who the minimum wage workers were. Um, but when we did that, 
what we found was that um, overall, there was no impact of employment loss, right? Following this minimum wage change, we found no evidence that jobs were lost. We did find this very small reduction in hours worked of 0.16 hours amongst minimum wage workers. That was statistically significant in 2016. But what we found was the major finding of that study was following the 2016 implementation increase in the minimum wage, the hours worked of, temp of those on temporary contracts fell by 2.7 um, hours per, work, per week. So these are people with very low levels of wage bargaining. So that, that was a concern. And it also sort of in built into our minds that when we are going forward in this research, you need to look for heterogeneous effects. You cannot just estimate an impact for all minimum wage workers and say, well, that's grand. There's nothing happening here. You need to look below the surface, and particularly for what we call career minimum wage workers. There's lots of people on the minimum wage for which this doesn't really matter. You know, they're students, they're gonna move on in a few years. They're second earners in high income households. But there are a group who are predominantly male, have longer tenure, have family responsibilities, who do rely on the minimum wage as their sole income who are heavily dependent upon it. So we term these career minimum wage workers. In Ireland, they tend to be more in the manufacturing sector. So number one, we need to look out for these heterogeneous impacts upon, among particular groups of workers. And secondly, we need to be sure that there is definitely no adverse effects being, being felt by workers who are career minimum wage workers. So this is what we do in our next paper, and this is only, um, published a few years ago, no, a few months ago. Um, so, so now we say, well, look, we see what the 2016 effect is. Let's see what the 2017 effect is and the 2018 effect has, because minimum wage impacts can evolve over time, as I'll show you. And also the impacts on particular groups of workers can change over time. So our evidence is that there are some limited impacts in terms of this intensive margin where workers' hours are being cut as a result of the minimum wage, but it is localized within particular groups. So here you can see, uh, on, and uh, for this model, we estimate a fully flexible diff and diff, um, Moro and Regio. Uh, this is great in the sense that it subtracts out differences in pre-treatment dynamics, but this paper has not has this paper been published? No, no, it's not in the journal form yet. It's, but it's out as a report. So you can see here, here's the treatment period, 2015, okay? You can see in 2016, and everything, the diff and the diff relates to the 2015 point also. But you can see really that for all minimum wage workers, there wasn't any impact in 2016. It was starting to get a little bit negative in 2017. But by 2018, you can look at that as a cumulative impact. We were finding that across all minimum wage workers, they had lost an hour per week as a result of the minimum wage, looking back to the 2015 pre-treatment period. And that result differed. We got different results, and it was being driven in different ways depending on the type of worker that we were looking at. So here's the, temp the guys in temporary contracts. So here, we're using a different data set, but we get the same result that we got in our fiscal studies paper, this two and a half hours drop in 2016. And you can see what was happening in 2016. It was, there was a slight decline following the minimum wage and the hours worked of the people on minimum wages, but there was a much bigger increase in the hours worked among people who were earning above the minimum wage. We found then in 2017, this sort of trended downwards together, but by 2018, Actually, the negative effect that we observed in 2016 for temporary workers had dissipated, it had gone. So in that case, things had sort of evened out following the minimum wage uh, changes, and by 2018, temporary workers were no longer being negatively affected. Different case for the non-nationals. So in terms of the non-nationals, following the minimum wage, both uh, the hours worked of both non minimum and non-minimum non-nationals increased, but you can see they started to diverge in 2017, and by 2018, 
minimum wage workers who were non-nationals were being employed for two and a half hours a week less than minimum wage workers who were, who were um, Irish nationals. Very worrying. Again, we find different defaults and move it through. This is the bit that worries us a lot. These are the guys that are career minimum wage workers. The minimum wage workers in manufacturing who they said have longer tenure, um, are more likely to have family responsibilities. By 2018, we saw these cumulative, it, 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 it jumps about a bit, but by 2018, those guys had um, lost about three hours per week following the minimum wage compared to non-minimum wage workers in terms of our, in, our diff and diff uh, estimates. So that, that, that is obviously hugely worrying. And then uh, accommodation and food, that was okay for the first couple of years, but we see a negative effect kicking in for guys in that sector. Again, a group of workers with particularly low levels of bargaining power. And finally, we do some interaction effects. I think this is more significant than it looks, but we were hitting sample size prop, um, difficulties here. This is the impact amongst non-nationals in accommodation and food. So, as I said, there is this issue of heterogeneous effects. Don't look at the overall top line estimate and say everything's okay. You need to look below the surface and see what are the groups, are there differences in the groups that are being affected? Who are they? What is their poverty risk, et cetera? And that's really what you need to be telling policymakers in this area. So you can see that uh, there was a reduction in terms of, in Ireland, non-nationals, these career workers in manufacturing, accommodation and food, and particularly Irish non-nationals in accommodation and food in Ireland. In terms of, we didn't see any effect in these other components of the economy. Now, it is worth noting that as these groups of workers' wages are falling, their minimum wage levels are also increasing. So it is possible that you lose a number of hours worked, but your take-home or nominal pay remains constant because you're being compensated by a higher minimum wage. So this is, this is the, you can see how, first of all, how we get heterogeneous effects and how they vary over time. But when we see, um, for the groups that were adversely affected, what we do here is we say, well, actually what's happened to their nominal wages? And even though they suffered hours lost, these groups, as a result of the minimum wage increase, their nominal wages increased. However, I would say for the guys in accommodation and food, even though we had, and, and industry, uh, these are nominal. Probably when you strip out inflation uh, in terms of real wages, I would expect, even though we had low inflation during that period, their, their incomes would have, would have dropped. So, so these are the types of things that uh, we take to the to Low Pay Commission. I'll move on. I don't know how I'm doing for time, Maria. Okay, no bother. So, we, we, do, we do have these concerns, but I, we've, we've spoken about poverty before. Um, I, I've shown you that minimum wages are very poorly correlated with poverty. But I'm only looking at the poverty or the, the impacts of the minimum wage on the people on minimum wages and how, they are, and how that's related to poverty. But, but what if it's the case that in Ireland, for example, the minimum wage hits the bottom 10% of workers? But what, as a result of that minimum wage, Non-minimum wage workers look behind them and say, well, we want to maintain our relativities. And they go into a wage bargaining process that also increases the wage levels of the next 10% of the workforce. In that case, then, the minimum wage arguably has an impact on the 10% who are directly affected by the minimum wage and have their earnings lifted. And then the next 10% in the wage distribution who, as a result of the minimum wage, have bargained their, their wages upwards also. So the impact on in-work poverty goes from the bottom 10% of the wage distribution to potentially the bottom 20% or the bottom 30%. But these diff and diff methodologies don't allow us to see that. So what we do here, and this is a paper that we published in Oxford Economic Papers last year, is we say, well, actually, look at, let's look at the impact of minimum wages on the total distribution, the cumulative distribution function of wages, and see, actually, who, who exactly gets shifted out uh, following a minimum wage increase. And this is quite um, sort of simple stuff. So what we do here is we use silk data. We estimate um, 
a distributional uh, regression approach, which is it's theoretically equivalent to uh, quantile regression. Well, you can see it, but I can't. <laughs> uh, so it's it's theoretically equivalent to a quantile regression approach, uh, although a lot of research says it fits wage distributions better. And what we do here is very simple. We have a wage distribution in 2015, and we have a wage distribution in 2016. We estimate regressions for different sections of the 2015 wage distribution based on the characteristics of people that were in the employment in 2015. And then we average those coefficients over the actual characteristics of people in the labor market in 2016. And then that gives us a counterfactual because it tells us here is the 2016 wage distribution and here is the 2016 wage distribution given the wage relationships that existed in 2015 before the minimum wage was struck. And by comparing those distributions, um, we can look at the impact, the overall impact of the minimum wage on, 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 on the work earnings distribution. I'll show you graphically in a little minute. And it's sort of like an Oaxaca decomposition. We can then back out the parts of the wage, that change that is due to a pure price effect, a pure minimum wage effect. But remember, some of the characteristics and makeup of the labor market will have changed between 2015 and 2016. So some of the wage changes will be due to changes in the composition of workers over that period. So we can back out the price and composition effect separately in a very, very simple, simple way, very similar to what we do in a Hohaka uh, decomposition. So when we do that, uh, what we find is that if we look at the distribution of uh, earnings here, without the minimum wage in 2016, if you look at this counterfactual distribution, we would expect that around 10% of workers would have been earning below the 915 level, which is the 2016 minimum wage. But when we look at the actual distribution, okay, we find that, that only 6% of workers actually earn below that level. So we can see that okay, the minim, the, as a result of the minimum wage, the proportion of workers earning below the minimum wage fell from 10 to 6%. Or, you know, or, or there was a reduction of four percentage points in that segment of the distribution. But what we also found was very significant spillover effects in the distributional impact. So we found that actually there were significant shifts in the distribution up to around 12, 15 an hour. So that the minimum wage change that affected just 10% of workers in Ireland in 2016 actually had some sort of significant wage impacts for the bottom 30% of the income uh, distribution. So here you can see it. Okay, so the, the 2016 line here is the actual CDF of wages for 2016. This is our counterfactual. This is what we estimate using the, the coefficients from the 2015 model. And you can see that all the action is around that minimum wage increase point, that red line of 9.15. That's where the minimum wage was struck. You can see that all of the action is there. So you can see that there's a significant reduction in the proportions, four percentage points when you add, fill in that tail and add it up, of people earning below that 9.16. That's much lower in the actual 2016 uh, distribution compared to what we would affect. But you can also see that there are impacts beyond the minimum wage range. Yeah? And this is where we back out the, 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 the composition and the price effect. So you can see that uh, the total difference at the minimum wage range is all a price effect. It's all the minimum wage. And here we're saying, well, the proportion of, uh, as a result of, the, of minimum wage workers, the proportion earning below this is four percentage points below what we would expect before the minimum, if the minimum wage had not existed. But you can see that there are also proportions earning higher levels of wages that have also fallen two percentage points at this level here as a result of that minimum wage. So that's the, the incremental shift up the distribution. You can see that this is the composition effect so that as we go up, the, 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 um, we, we subtract the composition effect from the total effect to get the price effect. So it's, there's a zero price effect there uh, further on. And this is just where we put standard errors around that price effect, okay? So what we're saying is there are significant reductions in the proportion of people, four percentage points here at the minimum wage rate, and that's statistically significant. But this statistical significance effect 
in terms of shifting people from higher, from lower to higher parts of the wage distribution goes up to 1260, which affects the bottom 30% of earnings. And we can look at, if we look at just the, um, these ratios, which are measures of general wage inequality uh, in the Irish labour market, you can see that both using the ratio of the 90th to the 10th wage uh, percentiles, or the 75th to the 25th, you can see that there's been a, a drop there in terms of general wage inequality following this one uh, minimum wage um, in increment. And here we can do it in terms of what would inequality be like in the counterfactual um, distribution, the counterfactual CDF compared to the actual. And what we found that um, there was about an 8% reduction in wage inequality using the counterfactual distributions as opposed to the actual, as a result of one increase in the minimum wage. So this is the point that I'm stressing is that when the, by focusing just on the poverty and in-work poverty impacts of minimum wage workers only, we're missing most of the story. Other points to make, other studies that we've published or not, um, but the work that we've done, we looked at the question of labor market transitions. So a lot of people will argue minimum wages are important because they allow low-skilled workers a footstep onto the labor market that will ultimately allow them to progress to higher and better earnings. Excuse me. We did find some evidence of that. We found that minimum wage workers were likely to move on to higher wage employment after a period, but we also found that they were more likely uh, to move into inactivity or unemployment um, compared to non-minimum wage workers, which relates to, I suppose, the precarious nature of minimum wage work. The Irish data, um, we pushed the CSO. There's so much noise when you're trying to estimate minimum wages, when you're trying to take together monthly earnings, monthly hours worked, and then you're trying to convert them to an hourly pay rate, and then you're trying to measure the minimum wage. It's very noisy. Um, so when you, if, I, if I estimated minimum wage non-compliance using self data, I'd probably get something in the region of 15 to 20%. It would tell, the wage data would tell me there's 15% of people earning below the minimum wage that shouldn't be. So we pushed the CSO to get a data, a, a, just a question in the labor force survey. Do you earn the minimum wage? Yes or no? Do you earn less than the minimum wage? What are the reasons for that? Is it sub minima rate? Is it a trainee rate or whatever? Um, so using that variable, we found that actually non-compliance uh, and minimum wage compliant, uh, 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 minimum wage in Ireland is actually very low. Only around 5% of workers, we feel um, that should be on the minimum wage who are not. Uh, and that's much lower than, than you get if you're using uh, these combinations of hours and earnings. Now, the final point that I'll make for summing up is, yeah, what's the impact on labor costs? Again, we were, so there is this sort of fear that the increasing minimum wages can be very damaging to, to, to firms. Again, we had the nice example. We have a database in Ireland uh, that's a firm level database. It tells us about average labor costs in terms of hourly or weekly pay, but it also tells us the proportion of workers who are employed within the firm who are on the minimum wage. So again, we were able to op estimate diff and diff models, uh, 2015 to 2016, the treatment group being employers who had minimum wage workers relative to employers who had not minim minimum wage workers. And what we found was that for the vast majority of firms following a major a minimum wage increase, there was no increase in overall labor costs. So that tells us there's, there's very little incentive there uh, for employers to adjust anything as a result of that minimum wage uh, change. For, for most employers, there are no impacts. But there were impacts detected in highly intensive minimum wage firms. So when we looked at firms where over 50% of employees were in minimum wages, not surprisingly, we found that as was following the, the minimum wage change, the diff and diff estimate told us that labor costs increased by three to four percentage points. But it's important to point out that those high minimum wage intensive firms only account for around 3% of all firms. So it's a very, very small number of firms. But it can be problematic if you have organizations that are employing mostly minimum wage workers, obviously. We did find that, um, again, we found a three to five percent reduction uh, in the probability that minimum wage intensive firms paid any overtime to part-time workers 
And the high intensity minimum wage firms also reduced overtime of full-time employees by 13%. So the high intensive firms did experience labor costs increases and they reacted to that by cutting the overtime of um, both part-time employees and, and, and all employees. So we saw that behavior quite clearly in the results. So just to sum up then, you'll be glad we're there now. Um, minimum wages, uh, why do we have them? They're typically accepted as being uh, providing a, a floor for low-paid workers. Um, and, and as I said, they, they are a common feature of um, labor markets, particularly those workers who have low bargaining power. In terms of the evidence, as I said, there is very little evidence that, minimum wage, that low paid workers lose their jobs as a result of minimum wages. What I've shown you today is that there are more effects, impacts on the intensive margin, particularly upon particular groups of workers who find that their hours will be reduced uh, following a minimum, a minimum wage change. And in some cases, those can be particularly damaging, as I said, particularly for uh, minimum wage workers who are career minimum wage workers. It's often said that the minimum wage is a blunt tool in terms of combating in work poverty. But as you've seen, the extent of this varies from country to country. Uh, it's probably true in terms of Ireland. It's much less true uh, in terms of, of Spain. But what I've also shown you is by just focusing on the poverty rates of minimum wage workers and ignoring these larger distributional spillover effects, will underestimate the impact of minimum wages on poverty. We need to keep an eye on how things change over time. It is not sufficient to do one minimum wage evaluation and say, that's it, lads, all good, and walk away. Things evolve, either at the aggregate level or at the individual uh, worker group level, so you need to keep a, a check on that. It is also, this is, I think, an important point uh, that, that is made, is that, look, most, in terms of uh, combating poverty, the minimum wages should not be your major tool. Most people who are in poverty aren't in employment. They tend to be unemployed, disabled, children, or pensioners, etc. cetera. Um, and while it is sufficient to have, and important that you have a minimum wage as an anti-poverty uh, tool for people in, in, in work poverty, it is not sufficient to turn around and everybody and, and use it as your only policy tool. Now, I don't know what the situation is in Spain, but I look at UK politicians and British politicians all the time saying the number of people working at going to food banks, etc. And all, the only thing that they always say is, well, we have the living wage or we increase the living wage. That's, that's irrelevant because most people who are subject to poverty aren't in work. So, you, so if that's your only policy tool, it's a complete and abject failure of responsibility. Uh, and finally, I'd say, you know, there are different mechanisms in terms of how the minimum wage is set, and they vary across countries. It's difficult to see exactly what um, the, um, how important the minimum wage, wage of setting mechanism is for the impacts, but I think it's fair to say that the more consultative and the more inclusive the process, the more likely it is to be acceptable, and the more likely, the less likely it is probably to have uh, negative outcomes either for, for workers or firms. Thank you.